Chapter Four of Mount Royal, Volume One by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Love, Thou Art Leading Me from Wintry Cold. After this came two or three dull and showery days, which afforded no opportunity for long excursions or ramblings of any kind. It was only during such rambles that Mister Hamley and Miss Courtenay ever found themselves alone mrs tregonell's ideas of propriety were of the old-fashioned school and when her niece was not under her own wing she expected miss bridgman to perform all the duties of a duenna in no wise suspecting how very loosely her instructions upon this point were being carried out at mount royal there was no possibility of confidential talk between angus and christabel if they were in the drawing-room or library mrs tregonell was with them if they played billiards miss bridgman was told off to mark for them if they went for a constitutional walk between the showers or wasted half an hour in the stables looking at horses and dogs miss bridgman was bidden to accompany them and though they had arrived at the point of minding her very little and being sentimental and sympathetic under her very nose still there are limits to the love-making that can be carried on before a third person and a man would hardly care to propose in the presence of a witness so for three days christabel still remained in doubt as to mr hamley's real feelings that manner of making tender little speeches and then as it were recalling them was noticeable many times during those three days of domesticity there was a hesitancy an uncertainty in his attentions to christabel which jessie interpreted ill there is some entanglement i dare say she told herself it is the evil of his past life which holds him in the toils how do we know that he has not a wife hidden away somewhere he ought to declare himself or he ought to go away if this kind of shilly-shallying goes on much longer he will break christabel's heart miss bridgman was determined that if it were in her power to hasten the crisis the crisis should be hastened the proprieties as observed by mrs tregonell might keep matters in abeyance till christmas mr hamley gave no hint of his departure he might stay at mount royal for months sentimentalizing with christabel and ride off at the last uncompromised the fourth day was the feast of st luke the weather had brightened considerably but there was a high wind a south-west wind with occasional showers of course you are going to church this morning said jessie to christabel as they rose from the breakfast table church this morning repeated christabel vaguely for the first time since she had been old enough to understand the services of her church she had forgotten a saint's day it is st luke's day yes i remember and the service is at minster we can walk across the hills may i go with you asked mr hamley do you like weekday services inquired jessie with a rather mischievous sparkle in her keen grey eyes i adore them answered angus who had not been inside a church on a weekday since he was best man at a friend's wedding then we will all go together said jessie may brooke bring the pony carriage to fetch us home mrs tregonell i have an idea that mr hamley won't be equal to the walk home more than equal to twenty such walks answered angus gaily you underestimate the severity of the training to which i have submitted myself during the last three weeks the pony carriage may as well meet you in any case said mrs tregonell and the order was straightway given they started at ten o'clock giving themselves ample leisure for a walk of something over two miles a walk by hill and valley and rushing stream and picturesque wooden bridge through a deep gorge where the dark red cattle were grouped against a background of gorse and heather a walk of which one could never grow weary so lonely so beautiful so perfect a blending of all that is wildest and all that is most gracious in nature an alpine ramble on a small scale mr church lies in a hollow of the hill so shut in by the wooded ridge which shelters its grey walls that the stranger comes upon it as an architectural surprise how is it that you have never managed to finish your tower asked mr hamley surveying the rustic fane with a critical air as he descended to the churchyard by some rugged stone steps on the side of the grassy hill you cannot be particularly devout people or you would hardly have allowed your parish church to remain in this stunted and stinted condition there was a tower once said christabel naively the stones are still in the churchyard but the monks used to burn a light in the tower window a light that shone through a cleft in the hills and was seen far out at sea i believe that is geographically 
or geometrically impossible said angus laughing but pray go on the light was often mistaken for a beacon and the ships came ashore and were wrecked on the rocks naturally and no doubt the monks improved the occasion why should a cornish monk be better than his countrymen one and all is your motto they were not cornish monks answered christabel but a brotherhood of french monks from the monastery of st sergius at angers they were established in a priory here by william de botreau in the reign of richard coeur de lyon and according to tradition the townspeople resented their having built the church so far from the town i feel sure the monks could have had no evil intention in burning a light but one night a crew of wild sailors attacked the tower and pulled the greater part of it down and nobody in beaucastle has had public spirit enough to get it set up again where is your respect for those early christian martyrs saint sergius and saint bacchus to whose memory your temple is dedicated i don't suppose it was so much want of respect for the martyrs as want of money suggested miss bridgman we have too many chapel people in beaucastle for our churches to be enriched or beautified but minster is not a bad little church after all it is the dearest sweetest most innocent little church i ever knelt in answered angus and if i could but assist at one particular service there he checked himself with a sigh but this unfinished speech amounted in miss bridgman's mind to a declaration she stole a look at christabel whose fair face crimsoned for a moment or so only to grow more purely pale afterwards they went into the church and joined devoutly in the brief saint day's service the congregation was not numerous two or three village goodies the school children a tourist who had come to see the church and found himself as it were entangled in saintly meshes the lady who played the harmonium and the incumbent who read prayers these were all besides the party from mount royal there are plenty of people in country parishes who will be as pious as you please on sunday deeming three services not too much for their devotion but who can hardly be persuaded to turn out of the beaten track of a weekday life to offer homage to the memory of evangelist or apostle the pony carriage was waiting in the lane when mr hamley and the two ladies came out of the porch christabel and the gentleman looked at the equipage doubtfully you slandered me miss bridgman by your suggestion that i should be done up after a mile or so across the hills said mr hamley i never felt fresher in my life have you a hankering for the ribbons to christabel or will you send your pony back to his stable and walk home i would ever so much rather walk and so would i in that case if you don't mind i think i'll go home with felix said jessie bridgman most unexpectedly i am not feeling quite myself to-day and the walk has tired me you won't mind going home alone with mr hamley will you christabel you might show him the seals in pentagon bay what could christabel do if there had been anything in the way of an earthquake handy she would have felt deeply grateful for a sudden rift in the surface of the soil which would have allowed her to slip into the bosom of the hills among the gnomes and the pixies that cornish coast was undermined with caverns yet there was not one for her to drop into again jessie bridgman spoke in such an easy off-hand manner as if it were the most natural thing in the world for christabel and mr hamley to be allowed a lonely ramble to have refused or even hesitated would have seemed affectation mock modesty self-consciousness yet christabel almost involuntarily made a step towards the carriage i think i had better drive she said aunt diana will be wanting me no she won't replied jessie resolutely and you shall not make a martyr of yourself for my sake i know you love that walk over the hill and mr hamley is dying to see pentagon bay positively expiring by inches only it is one of those easy deaths that does not hurt one very much said angus helping miss bridgman into her seat giving her the reins and arranging the rug over her knees with absolute tenderness take care of felix pleaded christabel and if you trot down the hills trot fast i shall walk him every inch of the way the responsibility would be too terrible otherwise but felix had his own mind in the matter and had no intention of walking when the way he went carried him towards his stable so he trotted briskly up the lane between tall tangled blackberry hedges leaving christabel and angus standing at the churchyard gate the rest of the little congregation had dispersed the church door had been locked there was a grave-digger at work in the garden-like churchyard amidst long grasses and fallen leaves and the unchanged ferns and mosses of the bygone summer 
mr hamley had scarcely concealed his delight at miss bridgeman's departure yet now that she was gone he looked passing sad never a word did he speak as they two stood idly at the gate listening to the dull thud of the earth which the grave-digger threw out of his shovel on to the grass and the shrill sweet song of a robin piping to himself on a ragged thorn-bush near at hand as if in ecstasy of gladness about things in general one sound so fraught with melancholy the other so full of joy the contrast struck sharply on christabel's nerves to-day at their utmost tension and brought sudden tears in her eyes they stood for perhaps five minutes in this dreamy silence the robin piping all the while and then mr hamley roused himself seemingly with an effort are you going to show me the seals at pentargon he asked smilingly i don't know about seals there is a local idea that seals are to be seen playing about in the bay but one is not often so lucky as to find them there people have been very cruel in killing them and i'm afraid there are very few seals left on our coast now at any rate you can show me pentargon if you're not tired tired cried christabel laughing at such a ridiculous idea being a damsel to whom ten miles were less than three to a town-bred young lady embarrassed though she felt by being left alone with mr hamley she could not even pretend that the proposed walk was too much for her i shall be very glad to take you to pentargon she said it is hardly a mile out of our way but i fear you'll be disappointed there is really nothing particular to see i shall not be disappointed i shall be deeply grateful they walked along the narrow hillside pass where it was almost impossible for two to walk abreast yet angus contrived somehow to be at christabel's side guiding and guarding her by ways which were so much more familiar to her than to him that there was a touch of humour in this pretence of protection but christabel did not see things in their humorous aspect to-day her little hand trembled as it touched angus hamley's when he led her across a craggy bit of path or over a tiny water-pool at the stiles in the valley on the other side of the bridge which are civilized stiles and by no means difficult christabel was too quick and light of foot to give any opportunity for that assistance which her companion was so eager to afford and now they were in the depths of the valley and had to mount another hill on the road to bood till they came to a field-gate above which appeared a signboard and the mystic words to pentargon what is pentargon that they put up its name in such big letters asked mr hamley staring at the board is it a borough town or a cattle market or a cathedral city or what they seem tremendously proud of it it is nothing or only a shallow bay with a waterfall and a wonderful cave which i am always longing to explore i believe it is nearly as beautiful as the cavern in shelley's alastor but you will see what pentargon is like in less than five minutes they crossed a ploughed field and then by a big five-barred gate entered the magic region which was said to be the paradise of seals a narrow walk cut in a steep and rocky bank where the gorse and heather grew luxuriously above slate and spar described a shallow semicircle round one of the loveliest bays in the world a spot so exquisitely tranquil in this calm autumn weather so guarded and fenced in by the massive headlands that jutted out towards the main a peaceful haven seemingly so remote from that outer world to which belonged yonder white-winged ship on the verge of the blue that angus hamley exclaimed involuntarily here is peace surely this must be a bay in that lotus land which tennyson has painted for us hitherto their conversation had been desultory more fragmentary talk about the landscape and the loveliness of the autumn day with its clear bright sky and soft west wind they had been always in motion and there had been a certain adventurousness in the way that seemed to give occupation to their thoughts but now mr hamley came to a dead stop and stood looking at the rugged amphitheatre and the low weedy rocks washed smooth by the sea would you mind sitting down for a few minutes he asked this pentargon of yours is a lovely spot and i don't want to leave it instantly i have a very slow appreciation of nature it takes me a long time to grasp her beauties christabel seated herself on the bank which he had selected for her accommodation and mr hamley placed himself a little lower almost at her feet her face turned seaward his half towards her as if that lily face with its wild rose bloom were even lovelier than the sunlit ocean in all its variety of colour it is a delicious spot said angus i wonder whether tristan and isoult ever came here 
i can fancy the queen stealing away from the court and court foolery and walking across the sunlit hills with her lover it would be a rather long walk and there might be a difficulty about getting back in time for supper but one can picture them wandering by flowery fields or by the cliffs above that everlasting sea and coming here to rest and talk of their sorrow and their love can you not fancy her as matthew arnold paints her Quote, let her have her youth again let her be as she was then let her have her proud dark eyes and her petulant quick replies let her sweep her dazzling hand with its gesture of command and shake back her raven hair with the old imperious air End quote. i have an idea that the hibernian isult must have been a tartar though matthew arnold glosses over her peccadilloes so pleasantly i wonder whether she had a strong brogue and a sneaking fondness for usquebaugh please don't make a joke of her pleaded christabel she is very real to me i see her as a lovely lady tall and royal-looking dressed in long robes of flowered silk fringed with gold and tristan what of tristan is his image as clear in your mind how do you depict the doomed knight born to suffer and to sin destined to sorrow from the time of his forest birth motherless beset with enemies consumed by hopeless passion i hope you feel sorry for tristan who could help being sorry for him albeit he was a sinner i assure you in the old romance which you have not read which you would hardly care to read neither tristan nor isoult are spotless i have never thought of their wrong-doing their fate was so sad and they loved each other so truly and again you can believe perhaps you who are so innocent and confiding that a man who has sinned may forsake the old evil ways and lead a good life until every stain of that bygone sin is purified you can believe as the greeks believed in atonement and purification i believe as i hope all christians do that repentance can wash away sin even the accusing memory of wrong-doing and make a man's soul white and fair again that is a beautiful creed i think the gospel gives us warrant for believing as much not as some of the dissenters teach that one effort of faith an hour of prayer and ejaculation can transform a murderer into a saint but that earnest sustained regret for wrong-doing and a steady determination to live a better life yes that is real repentance exclaimed angus interrupting her common sense even without gospel light tells one that it must be good christabel may i call you christabel just for this one isolated half-hour of life here in pentargon bay you shall be miss courtney directly we leave this spot call me what you please i don't think it matters very much faltered christabel blushing deeply but it makes all the difference to me christabel i can't tell you how sweet it is to me just to pronounce your name if if i could call you by that name always or by a name still nearer and dearer but you must judge give me half an hour half an hour of heartfelt earnest truth on my side and pitying patience on yours christabel my past life has not been what a stainless christian would call a good life i have not been so bad as tristan i have violated no sacred charge betrayed no kinsman i suppose i have been hardly worse than the common run of young men who have the means of leading an utterly useless life i have lived selfishly unthinkingly caring for my own pleasure with little thought of anything that was to come afterwards either on earth or in heaven but all that is past and done with my wild oats are sown i have had enough of youth and folly when i came to cornwall the other day i thought that i was on the threshold of middle age and that middle age could give me nothing but a few years of pain and weariness but behold a miracle you have given me back my youth youth and hope and a desire for length of days and a passionate yearning to lead a new bright stainless life you have done all this christabel i love you as i never thought it possible to love i believe in you as i never before believed in woman and yet and yet he paused with a long heart-broken sigh clasped the girl's hand which had been straying idly among the faded heather and pressed it to his lips and yet i dare not ask you to be my wife shall i tell you why yes tell me she faltered her cheeks deadly pale her lowered eyelids heavy with tears 
i told you i was like achilles doomed to an early death you remember with what pathetic tenderness thetis speaks of her son Quote, few years are thine and not a lengthened term at once to early death and sorrows doomed beyond the lot of man End quote. the fates have spoken about me quite as plainly as ever the sea-nymph foretold the doom of her son he was given the choice of length of days or glory and he deemed fame better than long life but my life has been as inglorious as it must be brief three months ago one of the wisest of physicians pronounced my doom the hereditary malady which for the last fifty years has been the curse of my family shows itself by the clearest indications in my case i could have told the doctor this just as well as he told me but it is best to have official information i may die before i am a year older i may crawl on for the next ten years a fragile hothouse plant sent to winter under southern skies and you may recover and be strong and well again said christabel in a voice choked with sobs she made no pretence of hiding her pity or her love who can tell god is so good what prayer will he not grant us if we only believe in him faith will remove mountains i have never seen it done said angus i am afraid that no effort of faith in this degenerate age will give a man a new lung no christabel there is no chance of long life for me if hope if love could give length of days my new hopes born of you my new love felt for you might work that miracle but i am the child of my century i only believe in the possible and knowing that my years are so few and that during that poor remnant of life i may be a chronic invalid how can i how dare i be so selfish as to ask any girl young fresh and bright with all the joys of life untasted to be the companion of my decline the better she loved me the sadder would be her life the keener would be the anguish of watching my decay but it would be a life spent with you her days would be devoted to you if she really loved you she would not hesitate pursued christabel her hands clasped passionately tears streaming down her pale cheeks for this moment to her was the supreme crisis of fate she would be unhappy but there would be sweetness even in her sorrow if she could believe that she was a comfort to you christabel don't tempt me ah oh, my darling you don't know how selfish a man's love is how sweet it would be to me to snatch such bliss even on the brink of the dark gulf on the threshold of eternal light the eternal silence consider what you would take upon yourself you who perhaps have never known what sickness means have never seen the horrors of mortal disease yes i have sat with some of our poor people when they were dying i have seen how painful disease is how cruel nature seems and how hard it is for a poor creature racked with pain to believe in god's beneficence but even then there has been comfort in being able to help them and cheer them a little i have thought more of that than of the actual misery of the scene but to give all your young life all your days and thoughts and hopes to a doomed man think of that christabel when you are happy with him to see death grinning behind his shoulder to watch that spectacle which is of all nature's miseries the most awful the slow decay of human life a man dying by inches not death but dissolution if my malady were heart disease and you knew then at some moment undreamt of unlooked for death would come swift as an arrow from hecate's bow brief with no loathsome or revolting detail then i might say let us spend my remnant of life together but consumption you cannot tell what a painful ending that is poets and novelists have described it as a kind of euthanasia but the poetical mind is rarely strong in scientific knowledge i want you to understand all the horror of a life spent with a chronic sufferer about whom the cleverest physician in london has made up his mind answer me one question said christabel drying her tears and trying to steady her voice would your life be any happier if we were together till the end happier it would be a life spent in paradise pain and sickness could hardly touch me with their sting then let me be your wife christabel are you in earnest have you considered i consider nothing 
except that it may be in my power to make your life a little happier than it would be without me i want only to be sure of that if the doom were more dreadful than it is if there were but a few short months of life left for you i would ask you to let me share them i would ask to nurse you and watch you in sickness there would be no other fate on earth so full of sweetness for me yes even with death and everlasting mourning waiting for me at the end my christabel my beloved my angel my comforter i begin to believe in miracles i almost feel as if you could give me length of years as well as bliss beyond all thought or hope of mine christabel christabel god forgive me if i am asking you to wed sorrow but you have made this hour of my life an unspeakable ecstasy yet i will not take you quite at your word love you shall have time to consider what you are going to do time to talk to your aunt i want no time for consideration i will be guided by no one i think god meant me to love you and cure you i will believe anything you say yes even if you promised me a new lung god bless you my beloved you belong to those whom he does everlastingly bless who are so angelic upon this earth that they teach us to believe in heaven my christabel my own i promised to call you miss courtenay when we left pentargon but i suppose now you are to be christabel for the rest of my life yes always and all this time we have not seen a single seal exclaimed angus gaily his delicate features were radiant with happiness who could at such a moment remember death and doom all painful words which need be said had been spoken End of chapter four chapter five of mount royal volume one by mary elizabeth braden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the silver answer rang not death but love mrs tregonell and her niece were alone together in the library half an hour before afternoon tea when the autumn light was just beginning to fade and the autumn mist to rise ghost-like from the narrow little harbour of beaucastle miss bridgeman had contrived that it should be so just as she had contrived the visit to the seals that morning so christabel kneeling by her aunt's chair in the fire-glow just as she had knelt upon the night before mr hamley's coming with faltering lips confessed her secret my dearest i have known it for ever so long answered mrs tregonell gravely laying her slender hand sparkling with hereditary rings never so gorgeous as the gems bought yesterday on the girl's sunny hair i cannot say that i am glad no christabel i am selfish enough to be sorry for leonard's sake that this should have happened it was the dream of my life that you two should marry dear aunt we could never have cared for each other as lovers we had been too much like brother and sister not too much for leonard to love you as i know he does he was too confident too secure of his power to win you and i his mother have brought a rival here a rival who has stolen your love from my son don't speak of him bitterly dearest remember he is the son of the man you loved but not my son leonard must always be first in my mind i like angus hamley he is all that his father was yes it is almost a painful likeness painful to me who loved and mourned his father but i cannot help being sorry for leonard leonard shall be my dear brother always said christabel yet even while she spoke it it occurred to her that leonard was not quite the kind of person to accept the fraternal position pleasantly or indeed any secondary character whatever in the drama of life and when are you to be married asked mrs tregonell looking at the fire oh auntie do you suppose i have begun to think of that yet a while be sure that he has if you have not i hope he is not going to be in a hurry you were only nineteen last birthday i feel tremendously old said christabel we we were talking a little about the future this afternoon in the billiard-room and angus talked about the wedding being at the beginning of the new year but i told him i was sure you would not like that no indeed i must have time to get reconciled to my loss answered the dowager with her arm drawn caressingly round christabel's head as the girl leaned against her aunt's chair what will this house seem to me without my daughter 
leonard far away putting his life in peril for some foolish sport and you living heaven knows where for you would have to study your husband's taste not mine in the matter why shouldn't we live near you mr hamley might buy a place there is generally something to be had if one watches one's opportunity do you think he would care to sink his fortune or any part of it in a cornish estate or to live amidst these wild hills he says he adores this place he is in love and would swear as much of a worse place no bell i am not foolish enough to suppose that you and mr hamley are to settle for life at the end of the world this house shall be your home whenever you choose to occupy it and i hope you will come and stay with me sometimes for i shall be very lonely without you dear auntie you know how i love you you know how completely happy i have been with you how impossible it is that anything can ever lessen my love i believe that dear girl but it is rarely nowadays that ruth follows naomi our modern moose go where their lovers go and worship the same gods but i don't want to be selfish or unjust dear i will try to rejoice in your happiness and if angus hamley will only be a little patient if he will give me time to grow used to the loss of you he shall have you with your adopted mother's blessing he shall not have me without it said christabel looking up at her aunt with steadfast eyes she had said no word of the early doom of which angus had told her for worlds she could not have revealed that fatal truth she had tried to put away every thought of it while she talked with her aunt angus had urged her beforehand to be perfectly frank to tell mrs tregonell what a mere wreck of a life it was which her lover offered her but she had refused let that be our secret she said in her low sweet voice we want no one's pity we will bear our sorrow together and oh angus my faith is so strong god who has made me so happy by the gift of your love will not take you from me if if your life is to be brief mine will not be long my dearest if the gods will it so we will know no parting but be translated into some new kind of life together a modern bossus and philemon i think it would be wiser better to tell your aunt everything but if you think otherwise i will tell her nothing except that you love me and that with her consent i am going to be your wife and with this determination christabel had made her confession to her aunt the ice once broken everybody reconciled herself or himself to the new aspect of affairs at mount royal in less than a week it seemed the most natural thing in life that angus and christabel should be engaged there was no marked change in their mode of life they rambled upon the hills and went boating on fine mornings exploring that wonderful coast where the sea-birds congregate on rocky isles and fortresses rising sheer out of the sea in mighty caves the very tradition whereof sounds terrible caves that seem to have no ending but to burrow into unknown unexplored regions towards the earth's centre with major bree for their skipper and a brace of sturdy boatmen angus christabel and jessie bridgman spent several mild october mornings on the sea now towards cambeek anon towards trebarwith tintagel from the beach was infinitely grander than tintagel in its landward aspect here as norden says was that rocky and winding way up the steep sea cliff under which the sea waves wallow and so assail the foundation of the isle as may astonish an unstable brain to consider the peril for the least slip of the foot leads the whole body into the devouring sea to climb these perilous paths to spring from rock to rock upon the slippery beach landing on some long green slimy slab over which the sea washes was christabel's delight and mr hamley showed no lack of agility or daring his health had improved marvellously in that invigorating air christabel noteful of every change of hue in the beloved face saw how much more healthy a tinged cheek and brow had taken since mr hamley came to mount royal he had no longer the exhausted look or the languid air of a man who had ultimately squandered his stock of life and health his eye had brightened with no hectic light but with the clear sunshine of a mind at ease he was altered in every way for the better and now the autumn evenings were putting on a wintry air the lights were twinkling early in the alpine street of Bocastle. the little harbour was dark at five o'clock mr hamley had been nearly two months at mount royal and he told himself that it was time for leave-taking 
fain would he have stayed on stayed until that blissful morning when christabel and he might kneel side by side before the altar in minster church and be made one for ever one in life and death in a union as perfect as that which was symbolized by the plant that grew out of tristan's tomb and went down into the grave of his mistress unhappily mrs tregonell had made up her mind that her niece should not be married until she was twenty years of age and christabel's twentieth birthday would not arrive till the following midsummer to a lover's impatience so long an interval seemed an eternity but mrs tregonell had been very gracious in her consent to his betrothal so he could not disobey her christabel has seen so little of the world said the dowager i should like to give her one season in london before she marries just to rub off a little of the rusticity she is perfect i would not have her changed for worlds protested angus nor i but she ought to know a little more of society before she has to enter it as your wife i don't think a london season will spoil her and it will please me to chaperon her though i have no doubt i shall seem rather an old-fashioned chaperon that is just possible said angus smiling as he thought how closely his divinity was guarded the chaperons of the present day are very easy-going people or perhaps i ought to say that the young ladies of the present day have a certain yankee go aheadishness which very much lightens the chaperon's responsibility in point of fact the london chaperon has dwindled into a formula and no doubt she will soon be improved off the face of society so much the worse for society answered the lady of the old school and then she continued with a friendly air i dare say you know that i have a house in bolton row i have not lived in it since my husband's death but it is mine and i can have it made comfortable between this and the early spring i have been thinking that it would be better for you and christabel to be married in london the law business would be easier settled and you may have relations and friends who would like to be at your wedding yet who could hardly care to come to Bocastle. it is a long way admitted angus and people are so inconsistent they think nothing of going to engadine yet grumble consumedly at a journey of a dozen hours in their native land as if england were not worth the exertion then i think we are agreed that london is the best place for the wedding said mrs tregonell i am perfectly content but if you suggested timbuktu i should be just as happy this being settled mrs tregonell wrote at once to her agent with instructions to set the old house in bolton row in order for the season immediately after easter and christabel and her lover had to reconcile their minds to the idea of a long dreary winter of severance miss courtenay had grown curiously grave and thoughtful since her engagement a change which jessie who watched her closely observed with some surprise it seemed as if she had passed from girlhood into womanhood in the hour in which she pledged herself to angus hamley she had for ever done with the thoughtless gaiety of youth that knows not care she had taken upon herself the burden of an anxious self-sacrificing love to no one had she spoken of her lover's precarious hold upon life but the thought of by how frail a tenure she held her happiness was ever present with her how can i be good enough to him how can i do enough to make his life happy she thought when it may be for so short a time with this ever-present consciousness of a fatal future went the desire to make her lover forget his doom and the ardent hope that the sentence might be revoked that the doom pronounced by human judgment might yet be reversed indeed angus had himself begun to make light of his malady who could tell that the famous physician was not a false prophet after all the same dire announcement of untimely death had been made to lee hunt who contrived somehow not always in the smoothest waters to steer his frail bark into the haven of old age angus spoke of this hopefully to christabel as they loitered within the roofless crumbling walls of the ancient oratory above st nectan's kiev one sunny november morning miss bridgman rambling on the crest of the hill with the black sheep-dog randy under the polite fiction of blackberry hunting among hedges which had long been shorn of their last berry though the freshness of the lichens and ferns still lingered in this sheltered nook yes i know that cruel doctor was mistaken said christabel her lips quivering a little her eyes wide and grave but tearless as they gazed at her lover i know it i know it i know that i am twice as strong and well as i was when he saw me answered angus you have worked as great a miracle for me as ever was wrought at the grave of st Mertheriana in minster churchyard you have made me happy and what can cure a man better than perfect bliss 
but oh my darling what is to become of me when i leave you when i return to the beaten ways of london life and looking back at these delicious days ask myself if this sweet life with you is not some dream which i have dreamed and which can never come again you will not think anything of the kind said christabel with a pretty little air of authority which charmed him as all her looks and ways charmed him you know that i am sober reality and that our lives are to be spent together and you are not going back to london at least not to stop there you are going to the south of france indeed this is the first i have heard of any such intention did not that doctor say you were to winter in the south he did but i thought we had agreed to despise that doctor we will despise him yet be warned by him why should any one who has liberty and plenty of money spend his winter in a smoky city where the fog blinds and stifles him and the frost pinches him and the damp makes him miserable when he can have blue skies and sunshine and flowers and ever so much brighter stars a few hundred miles away we are bound to obey each other are we not angus is not that among our marriage vows i believe there is something about obedience on the lady's side but i waive that technicality i am prepared to become an awful example of a henpecked husband if you say i am to go southward with the swallows i will go yea verily to algeria or tunis if you insist though i would rather be on the riviera whence a telegram with the single word come would bring me to your side in forty-eight hours yes you will go to that lovely land on the shores of the mediterranean and there you will be very careful of your health so that when we meet in london after easter your every look will gainsay that pitiless doctor will you do this for my sake angus she pleaded lovingly nestling at his side as they stood together on a narrow path that wound down to the entrance of the kiev they could hear the rush of the waterfall in the deep green hollow below them and the faint flutter of loosely hanging leaves stirred lightly by the light wind and far away the joyous bark of a sheep-dog no human voices save their own disturbed the autumnal stillness this and much more would i do to please you love indeed if i am not to be here i might just as well be in the south nay much better than in london or paris both of which cities i know by heart but don't you think we could make a compromise and that i might spend the winter at torquay running over to mount royal for a few days occasionally no torquay will not do delightful as it would be to have you so near i have been reading about the climate in the south of france and i am sure if you are careful a winter there will do you worlds of good next year next year we can go there together and you will take care of me was that what you were going to say bell something like that yes he said slowly after a thoughtful pause i shall be glad to be away from london and all the old associations my past life is a worthless husk that i have done with for ever End of chapter five Chapter Six, Part One of Mount Royal, Volume One by Mary Elizabeth Braden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six in Society, Part One. The Easter recess was over. Society had returned from its brief holiday, its glimpse of budding hedges and primrose dotted banks, blue skies and blue violets, the snowy bloom of orchards, the tender green of young cornfields. Society had come back again and was hard at the London treadmill yawning at old operas and damning new plays sniggering at crowded soirees laying down the law each man his particular branch thereof at carefully planned dinner parties quarrelling and making friends again eating and drinking spending and wasting and pretending to care very little about anything for society is as salt that has lost its savour if it is not cynical and affected but there was one debutante at least that season for whom town pleasures had lost none of their freshness for whom the old operas were all melody and the new plays all wit who admired everything with frankest wonder and enthusiasm and without a thought of horace or pope or creech or anybody except the lover who was always at her side and who shed the rose-coloured light of happiness upon the commonest things to sit in the green park on the mild april morning to see the guard turn out by st james's palace after breakfast to loiter away an hour or two at the picture gallery was to be infinitely happy 
neither opera nor play dinner nor dance race-course nor flower show was needed to complete the sun of christabel's bliss when angus hamley was with her he had returned from yerre quietest among the southern towns wonderfully improved in health and strength even mrs tregonell and miss bridgman perceived the change in him i think you must have been very ill when you came to mount royal mr hamley said jessie one day you look so much better now my life was empty then it is full now he answered it is hope that keeps a man alive and i had very little to hope for when i went westward how strange the road of life is and how little a man knows what is waiting for him round the corner the house in bolton row was charming just large enough to be convenient just small enough to be snug at the back the windows looked into lord somebody's garden not quite a tropical paradise nay even somewhat flavoured with bricks and mortar but still a garden where by sedulous art the gardeners kept alive ferns and flowers and where trees warranted to resist smoke put forth young leaves in the springtime and only languished and sickened in untimely decay when the london season was over and their function as fashionable trees had been fulfilled the house was furnished in a georgian style pleasant to modern taste the drawing-room was of the spindle-legged order satin-wood card tables groups of miniatures in oval frames japanese folding screen behind which belinda might have played bo peep china jars at whose fall narcissa might have inly suffered while outwardly serene the dining-room was sombre and substantial the bedrooms had been improved by modern upholstery for the sleeping apartments of our ancestors leave a good deal to be desired all the windows were full of flowers inside and out there was the perfume and colour of many blossoms the three drawing-rooms growing smaller to a diminishing point like a practical lesson in perspective were altogether charming major brie had escorted the ladies to london and was their constant guest camping out in a bachelor lodging in jermyn street and coming across piccadilly every day to eat his luncheon in bolton row and to discuss the evening's engagements long as he had been away from london he acclimatized himself very quickly found out everything about everybody what singers were best worth hearing what plays best worth seeing what actors should be praised which pictures should be looked at and talked about what horses were likely to win the notable races he was a walking guide a living handbook to fashionable london all mrs tregonell's old friends all the cornish people who came to london called in bolton row and at every house where the lady and her niece visited there were new introductions whereby the widow's visiting list widened like a circle in the water and cards for dances and evening parties afternoons and dinners were super abundant christabel wanted to see everything she had quite a country girl's taste and cared much more for the theatre and the opera than to be dressed in a new gown and to be crushed in a crowd of other young women in new gowns or to sit still and be admired at a stately dinner nor was she particularly interested in the leaders of fashion their ways and manners the newest professed or professional beauty the last social scandal she wanted to see the great city of which she had read in history the tower the savoy westminster hall the abbey st paul's the temple the london of elizabeth the still older london of edwards and henry's the house in which milton was born the organ on which he played the place where shakespeare's theatre once stood the old inn whence chaucer's pilgrims started on their journey even dickens london the london of pickwick and winkle the saracen's head at which mr squeers put up had charms for her is everything gone she asked piteously after being told how improvement had effaced the brick-and-mortar background of english history yet there still remained enough to fill her mind with solemn thoughts of the past she spent long hours in the abbey with angus and jessie looking at the monuments and recalling the lives and deeds of long-vanished heroes and statesmen the tower and the old inns of court were full of interest your curiosity about old houses and streets was insatiable no one less than macaulay could satisfy you said angus one day when his memory was at fault a man of infinite reading and infallible memory but you have read so much and you remember a great deal they had been prowling about the white hall end of the town in the bright early morning before fashion had begun to stir herself faintly among her down pillows christabel loved the parks and streets while the freshness of sunrise was still upon them and these early walks were an institution where is the decoy she asked angus one day in st james's park 
and on being interrogated it appeared that she meant a certain piece of water described in peveril of the peak all this part of london was peopled with scots heroes and heroines or with suggestions of goldsmith here fenella danced before good-natured loose living rowley here nigel stood aside amidst the crowd to see charles prince of wales and his ill-fated favourite buckingham go by here the citizen of the world met beau tibbs and the gentleman in black for christabel the park was like a scene in a stage play then after breakfast there were long drives into fair suburban haunts where they escaped in some degree from london smoke and london restraints of all kinds where they could charter a boat and row up the river to a still fairer scene and picnic in some rushy creek out of ken of society and be almost as reckless as gay as if they had been at tintagel these were the days angus loved best the days upon which he and his betrothed turned their backs upon london society and seemed as far away from the outside world as ever they had been upon the wild western coast like most men educated at eton and oxford and brought up in the neighbourhood of the metropolis angus loved the thames with a love that was almost a passion it is my native country he said i have no other all the pleasantest associations of my boyhood and youth are interwoven with the river when i die my spirit ought to haunt these shores like that ghost of the scholar gypsy which you have read about in arnold's poem he knew every bend and reach of the river every tributary creek and eyot almost every row of pollard willows standing stunted and grim along the bank like a line of rugged old men he knew where the lilies grew and where there were chances of trout the haunts of monster pike were familiar to him indeed he declared that he knew many of these gentlemen personally that they were as old as the fontainebleau carp and bore a charmed life when i was at eton i knew them all by sight he said there was one which i set my heart upon landing but he was ever so much stronger and cleverer than i if i had caught him i should have worn his skin ever after in the pride of my heart like hercules with his lion but he still inhabits the same creek still sulks among the same rushes and devours the gentler members of the finny race by shoals we christened him dr parr for we knew he was preternaturally old and we thought he must from mere force of association be a profound scholar mr hamley was always finding reasons for these country excursions which he declared were the one sovereign antidote for the poisoned atmosphere of crowded rooms and the evil effects of late hours you wouldn't like to see christabel fade and languish like the flowers in your drawing-room he urged when mrs tregonell wanted her niece to make a round of london visits instead of going down to maidenhead on the coach to lunch somewhere up the river not at skindle's or at any other hotel but in the lazy sultry quiet of some sequestered nook below the hanging woods of clive eden i am sure you can spare her for just to-day such a perfect spring day it would be a crime to waste such sunlight and such balmy air in town drawing-rooms could you not strain a point dear mrs tregonell and come with us aunt diana shook her head no the fatigue would be too much she had lived such a quiet life at mount royal that a very little exertion tired her besides she had some calls to make and then there was a dinner at lady bulteel's to which she must take christabel and an evening party afterwards christabel shrugged her shoulders impatiently i am beginning to hate parties she said they are amusing enough when one is in them but they are all alike and it would be so much nicer for us to live our own lives and go wherever angus likes don't you think you might defer the cause and come with us to-day auntie dear auntie dear shook her head even if i were equal to the fatigue bell i couldn't defer my visits thursday is lady onslow's day and mrs trevannion's day and mrs van sitstart's day and when people have been so wonderfully kind to us it would be uncivil not to call and you will sit in stifling drawing-rooms with the curtains lowered to shut out the sunlight and you will drink ever so much more tea than is good for you and hear a lot of people prosing about the same things over and over again epsom and the opera and mrs this and miss that and mrs somebody's new book which everybody reads and talks about just as if there were not another book in the world or as if the old book counted for nothing concluded christabel contemptuously having by this time discovered the conventional quality of kettledrum conversation wherein people discourse authoritatively about books they have not read plays they have not seen and people they do not know 
Mr. Hemley had his own way and carried off Christabel and Miss Bridgman to the White Horse Cellar with the faithful Major in attendance. "'You will bring Bell home in time to dress for Lady Bulteel's dinner,' said Mrs. Tregonell impressively as they were departing. "'Mind, Major, I hold you responsible for her return. You are the only sober person in the party. I believe Jessie Bridgman is as wild as a hawk when she gets out of my sight.' Jessie's shrewd grey eyes twinkled at the reproof. "'I am not very sorry to get away from Bolton Row, and the fine ladies who come to see you, and who always look at me as much as to say, "'Who is she? What is she? How did she come here?' "'And who are obviously surprised if I say anything intelligent, first at my audacity in speaking before company, and next that such a thing as I should have any brains.' "'Nonsense, Jessie! How thin-skinned you are! Everybody praises you!' said mrs tregonell while they all waited on the threshold for christabel to fasten her eight-button gloves a delicate operation in which she was assisted by mr hamley how clever you are at buttoning gloves exclaimed christabel one would think you had served an apprenticeship that's not the first pair he has buttoned i'll wager cried the major in his loud hearty voice and then seeing angus redden ever so slightly and remembering certain rumours which he had heard at his club the kindly bachelor regretted his speech happily christabel was engaged at this moment in kissing her aunt and did not observe mr hamley's heightened colour ten minutes later they were all seated outside the coach bowling down piccadilly hill on their way westward in the good old days this is how you would have started for cornwall said angus i wish we were going to cornwall now so do i if your aunt would let us be married at that dear little church in the glen Christabel, when I die, if you have the ordering of my funeral, be sure that I am buried in Minster Churchyard. Angus, don't, murmured Christabel piteously. Dearest, we must all die. Tis an inevitable chance. The first statute in Magna Carta, it is an everlasting act of Parliament. That's what he says of death, dear, who jested at all things, and laid his cap and bells down one day in a lodging in Bond Street, the end of which we passed just now sad and lonely and perhaps longing for the kindred whom he had forsaken you mean stern said christabel jessie and i hunted for that house yesterday i think we all feel sorrier for him than for many a better man in the early afternoon they had reached their destination a lovely creek shaded by chestnut and alder a spot known to few and rarely visited here under green leaves they moored their boat and lunched at the contents of a basket which had got ready for them at skindles dawdling over the meal taking their ease full of talk and laughter never had angus looked better or talked more gaily jessie too was at her brightest and had a great deal to say it is wonderful how well you two get on said christabel smiling at her friend's prompt capping of some bitter little speech from angus you always seem to understand each other so quickly indeed jessie seems to know what angus is going to say before the words are spoken i can see it in her face perhaps that is because we are both cynics said mr hamley yes that is no doubt the reason said jessie reddening a little the bond of sympathy between us is founded on our very poor opinion of our fellow-creatures but after this miss bridgman became more silent and gave way much less than usual to those sudden impulses of sharp speech which christabel had noticed they landed presently and went wandering away into the inland a strange world to christabel albeit very familiar to her lover not far from here there is a dell which is the most wonderful place in the world for bluebells said angus looking at his watch i wonder whether we should have time to walk there let us try if it is not very very far urged christabel i adore bluebells and skylarks and the cuckoo and all the dear country flowers and birds i have been surfeited with hot-house flowers and caged canaries since i came to london a skylark was singing in the deep blue far aloft over the little wood in which they were wandering it was the loneliest loveliest spot and christabel felt as if it would be agony to leave it she and her lover seemed ever so much nearer dearer more entirely united here than in london drawing-rooms where she hardly dared to be civil to him lest society should be amused or contemptuous here she could cling to his arm it seemed a strong and helpful arm now and look up at his face with love irradiating her own countenance and feel no more ashamed than even the garden here they could talk without fear of being heard 
for jessie and the major followed at a most respectful distance just keeping the lovers in view and no more christabel ran back presently to say they were going to look for bluebells you'll come won't you she pleaded angus says the dell is not far off i don't believe a bit in his topography said the major do you happen to know that it is three o'clock and that you are due at a state dinner at eight cried christabel ages away angus says the train goes at six we are to have some tea at skindle's at five we have two hours in which to do what we like there is the row back to skindle's say half an hour for that which gives us ninety minutes for the bluebells do you count life by minutes child asked the major yes uncle oliver when i am utterly happy for then every minute is precious and then she and her lover went rambling on talking laughing poeticing under the flickering shadows and glancing lights while the other two followed at a leisurely pace like the dull foot of reality following the winged heel of romance jessie bridgman was only twenty-seven yet in her own mind it seemed as if she were the major's contemporary nay indeed his senior for he had never known that grinding poverty which ages the eldest daughter in a large shabby genteel family jessie bridgman had been old in care before she left off pinafores her childish pleasure in the shabbiest of dolls had been poisoned by a precocious familiarity with poor rates and water rates a sickening dread of the shabby man in pepper and salt tweed with the end of an oblong account-book protruding from his breast pocket who came to collect money that was never ready for him and departed leaving a printed notice like the trail of the serpent behind him the first twenty years of jesse bridgman's life had been steeped in poverty every day every hour flavoured with the bitter taste of deprivation and the world's contempt the want of common comforts the natural longing for fairer surroundings the ever-present dread of a still lower deep in which pinching should become starvation and even the shabby home should be no longer tenable with a father whose mission upon this earth was to docket and file a certain class of accounts in somerset house for a salary of a hundred and eighty pounds a year and a biannual rise of five a harmless man whose only crime was to have married young and made himself responsible for an unanticipated family how could a young fellow of two-and-twenty know that god was going to afflict him with ten children mr bridgman used to observe plaintively with a mother whose life was one long domestic drudgery who spent more of her days in a back kitchen than is consistent with the maintenance of personal dignity and whose only chance of an airing was that stern necessity which impelled her to go and interview the tax-gatherer in the hope of obtaining time jessie's opportunities of tasting the pleasures of youth had been of the rarest once in six months or so perhaps a shabby genteel friend gave her father an order from some theatre which was in that palpable stage of ruin when orders are freely given to the tavern loafer and the stage door hanger on and then oh what rapture to trudge from shepherd's bush to the west end and to spend a long hot evening in the gassy paradise of the upper boxes once in a year or so mr bridgman gave his wife and eldest daughter a dinner at an italian restaurant near leicester square a cheap little pinchy dinner in which the meagre modicum of meat and poultry was eked out by much sauce redolent of garlic by delicious foreign bread and too odorous foreign cheese it was a tradition in the family that mr bridgman had been a great dinner-giver in his bachelor days and knew every restaurant in london they don't forget me here you see he said when the sleek italian waiter brought him extra knives and forks for the dual portion which was to serve for three such had been the utmost limit of jessie's pleasures before she answered an advertisement in the times which stated that a lady living in a retired part of cornwall required the services of a young lady who could write a good hand keep accounts and had some knowledge of housekeeping who was willing active cheerful and good-tempered salary thirty pounds per annum it was not the first advertisement by many that jessie had answered indeed she seemed to her own mind to have been doing nothing but answering advertisements and hoping against hope for a favourable reply since her eighteenth birthday when it had been borne in upon her as the evangelicals say that she ought to go out into the world and do something for her living making one mouth less to be filled from the family bread-pan there's no use talking mother she said when mrs bridgman tried to prove that the bright useful eldest daughter cost nothing i eat and food cost money i have a dreadfully healthy appetite and if i could get a decent situation i should cost you nothing and should be able to send you half my salary 
and now that milly is getting a big girl she hasn't an idea of making herself useful sighed the mother only yesterday she let the milkman ring three times and then march away without leaving us a drop of milk because she was too proud or too lazy to open the door while sarah and i were up to our eyes in the wash perhaps she didn't hear him suggested jessie charitably she must have heard his pails if she didn't hear him said mrs bridgman besides he youped for i heard him and relied upon that idle child for taking in the milk but put not your trust in princes concluded the overworked matron rather vaguely salary thirty pounds per annum repeated jessie reading the cornish lady's advertisement over and over again as if it had been a charm why that would be a perfect fortune think what you could do with an extra fifteen pounds a year my dear it would make my life heaven but you would want all the money for your dress you would always have to be nice there would be dinner parties no doubt and you would be asked to come into the drawing-room of an evening said mrs bridgman whose ideas of the governess's social status were derived solely from jane eyre jessie's reply to the advertisement was straightforward and succinct and she wrote a fine bold hand these two facts favourably impressed mrs tregonell and of the three or four dozen answers which her advertisement brought forth jessie's pleased her most the young lady's references to her father's landlord and the incumbent of the nearest church were satisfactory so one bleak wintry morning miss bridgman left paddington in one of the great westerns almost luxurious third-class carriages and travelled straight to launceston whence a carriage the very first private carriage she had ever sat in and every detail of which was a wonder and a delight to her conveyed her to mount royal that fine old tudor manor house after the shabby ten-roomed villa at shepherd's bush badly built badly drained badly situated badly furnished always smelling of yesterday's dinner always damp and oozy with yesterday's rain was almost too beautiful to be real for days after her arrival jessie felt as if she must be walking about in a dream the elegancies and luxuries of life were all new to her the perfect quiet and order of this country home the beauty in every detail from the old silver urn and wooster china which greeted her eyes on the breakfast table to the quaint little queen anne candlestick which she carried up to her bedroom at night seemed like a revelation of a hitherto unknown world the face of nature the hills and the moors the sea and the cliffs was as new to her as all that indoor luxury an occasional week at ramsgate or south end had been all her previous experience of this world's loveliness happily she was not a shy or awkward young person she accommodated herself with wonderful ease to her altered surroundings was not tempted to drink out of a finger-glass and did not waver for a moment as to the proper use of her fish-knife and fork took no wine and ate moderately of that luxurious and plentiful fare which was as new and wonderful to her as if she had been transported from the barren larder of shepherd's bush to that fabulous land where the roasted piglings ran about with knives and forks in their backs squeaking in pig language come eat me come eat me often in this paradise of pasties and clotted cream mountain mutton and barn-door fowls she thought with a bitter pang of the hungry circle at home with whom dinner was the exception rather than the rule and who made believe to think tea and bloaters an ever so much cosier meal than a formal repast of roast and boiled on the very day she drew her first quarter's salary not for worlds would she have anticipated it by an hour jessie ran off to a farm she knew of and ordered a monster hamper to be sent to roslyn villa shepherd's bush a hamper full of chickens and goose and cream and butter with a big saffron flavoured cake for its crowning glory such a cake as would delight the younger members of the household nor did she forget her promise to send the overtasked house mother half her earnings you needn't mind taking the money dearest she wrote in the letter which enclosed the post-office order mrs tregonell has given me a lovely grey silk gown and i have bought a brown merino at lanchester and a new hat and jacket you would stare to see how splendidly your homely little jessie is dressed christabel found out the date of my birthday and gave me a dozen of the loveliest gloves my favourite grey with four buttons a whole dozen did you ever see a dozen of gloves all at once mother you have no idea how lovely they look i quite shrink from breaking into the packet but i must wear a pair at church next sunday in compliment to the dear little giver 
if it were not for thoughts of you and the brood dearest i should be intensely happy here the house is an ideal house the people are ideal people and they treat me ever so much better than i deserve i think i have the knack of being useful to them which is a great comfort and i am able to get on with the servants old servants who had a great deal too much of their own way before i came which is also a comfort it is not easy to introduce reform without making oneself detested christabel who has been steeping herself in french history lately calls me tirgo in petticoats by which you will see she has a high opinion of my ministerial talents if you can remember tirgo poor dear amidst all your worries added jessie bethinking herself that her mother's book-learning had gone to seed in an atmosphere of petty domestic cares mending washing pinching contriving End of chapter six part one chapter six part two of mount royal volume one by mary elizabeth brayden this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six in society part two this and much more had jessie bridgman written seven years ago while mount royal was still new to her the place and the people at least those two whom she first knew there had grown dearer as time went on when leonard came home from the university he and his mother's factotum did not get on quite so well as mrs tregonell had hoped jessie was ready to be kind and obliging to the heir of the house but leonard did not like her in the language of the servants hall he put his back up at her he looked upon her as an interloper and a spy especially suspecting her in the latter capacity perhaps from a lurking consciousness that some of his actions would not bear the fierce light of unfriendly observation in vain did his mother plead for her favourite you have no idea how good she is said mrs tregonell you're perfectly right there mother i have not retorted leonard and so useful to me i should be lost without her of course that's exactly what she wants creeping and crawling and pinching and saving docking your tradesmen's accounts grinding your servants fingering your income till by and by she will contrive to finger a good deal of it into her own pocket that's the way they all begin that's the way the man in the play sir giles overreach's man began you may be sure till by and by he got sir giles under his thumb and that's the way miss bridgman will serve you i wonder you are so short-sighted weak as mrs tregonell was in her love for her son she was too staunch to be set against a person she liked by any such assertions as these she was quite able to form her own opinion about miss bridgman's character and she found the girl straight as an arrow candid almost to insolence yet pleasant withal industrious clever sharp as a needle in all domestic details able to manage pounds as carefully as she had managed pence and sixpences mother used to give me the housekeeping purse she said and i did what i liked i was always chancellor of the exchequer it was a very small exchequer but i learnt the habit of spending and managing and keeping accounts while active and busy about domestic affairs verifying accounts settling supplies and expenditures with a cook housekeeper making herself a veritable clerk of the kitchen and overlooking the housemaids in the finer details of their work miss bridgman still found ample leisure for the improvement of her mind in a quiet country house where family prayers are read at eight o'clock every morning the days are long enough for all things jessie had no active share in christabel's education which was mrs tregonell's delight and care but she contrived to learn what christabel learnt to study with her and read with her and often to outrun her in the pursuit of a favourite subject they learnt german together they read good french books together and were companions in the best sense of the word it was a happy life monotonous uneventful but a placid busy all-satisfying life which jessie bridgman led during those six years and a half which went before the advent of angus hamley at mount royal the companion's salary had long again been doubled and jessie who had no caprices and whose wants were modest was able to send forty pounds a year to shepherd's bush and found a rich reward in the increased cheerfulness of the letters from home just so much for jessie bridgman's history as she walks by major bree's side in the sunlight with a sharply cut face impressed with a gravity beyond her years and marked with precocious lines that were drawn there by the iron hand of poverty before she had emerged from girlhood of late even amidst the elegant luxuries of mayfair in a life given over to amusement among flowers and bright scenery and music and pictures 
those lines had been growing deeper lines that hinted at a secret care isn't it delightful to see them together said the major looking after those happy lovers with a benevolent smile yes i suppose it is very beautiful to see such perfect happiness like juan and hede before lambro swooped down upon them returned miss bridgman who was too outspoken to be ashamed of having read byron's epic major brie had old-fashioned notions about the books women should and should not read and byron except for elegant extracts was in his index expurgatorius if a woman was allowed to read the jower she would inevitably read don juan he argued there would be no restraining her after she had tasted blood no use in offering her another poet and saying now you can read thalaba or peter bell they were so happy said jessie dreamily so young and one so innocent and then came fear severance despair and death for the innocent sinner it is a terrible story fortunately there is no tyrannical father in this case replied the cheerful major everybody is pleased with the engagement everything smiles upon the lovers no it is all sunshine said jessie there is no shadow if if mr hamley is as worthy of his betrothed as we have all agreed to think him yet there was a time when you spoke rather disparagingly of him my gossiping old tongue should be cut out for repeating club scandals hamley is a generous-hearted noble-natured fellow and i am not afraid to trust him with the fate of a girl whom i love almost as well as if she were my own daughter i don't know whether all men love their daughters by the by there are daughters and daughters i have seen some that it would be tough work to love but for christabel my affection is really parental i have seen her bud and blossom a beautiful living flower a rose in the garden of life and you think mr hamley is worthy of her said miss bridgman looking at him searchingly with her shrewd grey eyes in spite of what you heard at the clubs a fico for what i heard at the clubs exclaimed the major blowing the slander away from the tips of his fingers as if it had been thistledown every man has a past and every man outlives it the present and the future are what we have to consider it is not a man's history but the man himself that concerns us and i say that angus hamley is a good man a right meaning man a brave and generous man if a man is to be judged by his history where would david be i should like to know and yet david was the chosen of the lord added the major conclusively i hope said jessie earnestly with vague visions of intrigue and murder conjured up in her mind that mr hamley was never as bad as david no no murmured the major the circumstances of modern times are so different don't you see an advanced civilization a greater respect for human life napoleon the first did a good many queer things but you would not get a monarch and a commander-in-chief to act as david and Job acted nowadays public opinion would be too strong for them they would be afraid of the newspapers was it anything very dreadful that you heard at the club three years ago asked jessie still hovering about a forbidden theme with a morbid curiosity strange in one whose acts and thoughts were for the most part ruled by common sense the major who would not allow a woman to read don juan had his own ideas of what ought and ought not to be told to a woman my dear miss bridgman he said i would not for worlds pollute your ears with the ribald trash men talk in a club smoking-room let it suffice for you to know that i believe in angus hamley although i have taken the trouble to make myself acquainted with the follies of his youth they walked on in silence for a little while after this and then the major said in a voice full of kindness i think you went to see your own people yesterday did you not yes mrs tregonell was kind enough to give me a morning and i spent it with my mother and sisters the major had questioned her more than once about her home in a way which indicated so kindly an interest that it could not possibly be mistaken for idle curiosity and she had told him with perfect frankness what manner of people her family were in no wise hesitating to admit their narrow means and the necessity that she should earn her own living i hope you found them well and happy i thought my mother looked thin and weary the girls were wonderfully well great hardy overgrown creatures i felt myself a wretched little shrimp among them as for happiness well they are as happy as people can expect to be who are very poor 
do you really think poverty is incompatible with happiness asked the major with a philosophical air i have had a particularly happy life and i have never been rich ah that makes all the difference exclaimed jessie you have never been rich but they have always been poor you can't conceive what a gulf lies between those two positions you have been obliged to deny yourself a great many of the mere idle luxuries of life i dare say hunters the latest improvements in guns valuable dogs continental travelling but you have had enough for all the needful things for neatness cleanliness an orderly household a well-kept flower garden everything spotless and bright about you no slipshod maid of all work printing her greasy thumb upon your dishes nothing out at elbows your house is small but of its kind it is perfection and your garden well if i had such a garden in such a situation i would not envy eve the eden she lost is that really your opinion cried the enraptured soldier or are you saying this just to please me to reconcile me to my jog-trot life my modest surroundings i mean every word i say then it is in your power to make me richer in happiness than rothschild or baring dearest miss bridgman dearest jessie i think you must know how devotedly i love you till to-day i have not dared to speak for my limited means would not have allowed me to maintain a wife as the woman i love ought to be maintained but this morning's post brought me the news of the death of an old admiral of the blue who was my father's first cousin he was a bachelor like myself left the navy soon after the signing of sir henry pottinger's treaty at nankin in forty two never considered himself well enough off to marry but lived in a lodging at devonport and hoarded and hoarded and hoarded for the mere abstract pleasure of accumulating his surplus income and the result of his hoarding combined with a little dodging of the investments in stocks and shares is that he leaves me a solid four hundred a year in great westerns it is not much from some people's point of view but added to my existing income it makes me very comfortable i could afford to indulge all your simple wishes my dearest i could afford to help your family he took her hand she did not draw it away but pressed it gently with the grasp of friendship don't say one word more you are too good you are the best and kindest man i have ever known she said and i shall love and honour you all my life but i shall never marry i made up my mind about that oh ever so long ago indeed i never expected to be asked if the truth must be told i understand said the major terribly dashed i am too old don't suppose that i have not thought about that i have but i fancied the difficulty might be got over you are so different from the common run of girls so staid so sensible of such a contented disposition but i was a fool to suppose that any girl of seven and twenty interrupted jessie it is a long way up the hill of girlhood i shall soon be going down on the other side at any rate you are more than twenty years my junior i was a fool to forget that dear major brie said jessie very earnestly believe me it is not for that reason i say no if you were as young as young as mr hamley the answer would be just the same i shall never marry there is no one prince or peasant whom i care to marry you are much too good a man to be married for the sake of a happy home for status in the world kindly companionship all of which you could give me if i loved you as you ought to be loved i would answer proudly yes but i honour you too much to give you half love perhaps you do not know with how little i could be satisfied urged the major opposing what he imagined to be a romantic scruple with the shrewd common sense of his fifty years experience i want a friend a companion a helpmate and i am sure you could be all those to me if i could only make you happy you could not interrupted jessie with cruel decisiveness pray never speak of this again dear major brie your friendship has been very pleasant to me it has been one of the many charms of my life at mount royal i would not lose it for the world and can we always be friends if you will only remember that i have made up my mind irrevocably never to marry i must needs obey you said the major deeply disappointed but too unselfish to be angry i will not be importunate yet one word i must say your future if you do not marry what is that to be 
of course so long as mrs tregonell lives your home will be at mount royal but i fear that does not settle the question for long my dear friend does not appear to me a long-lived woman i have seen traces of premature decay when christabel is married and mrs tregonell is dead where is your home to be providence will find me one answered jessie cheerfully providence is wonderfully kind to plain little spinsters with a knack of making themselves useful i have been doing my best to educate myself ever since i have been at mount royal it is so easy to improve one's mind when there are no daily worries about the tax-gatherer and the milkman and when i am called upon to seek a new home i can go out as a governess and drink the cup of life as it is mixed for governesses as charlotte bronte says perhaps i shall write a novel as she did although i have not her genius i would not be sure of that said the major i believe there is some kind of internal fire burning you up although you are outwardly so quiet i think it would have been your salvation to accept the jog-trot life and peaceful home i have offered you very likely replied jessie with a shrug and a sigh but how many people reject salvation they would rather be miserable in their own way than happy in anybody else's way the major answered never a word for him all the glory of the day had faded he walked slowly on by jessie's side meditating upon her words wondering why she had so resolutely refused him there had not been the least wavering she had not even seemed to be taken by surprise her mind had been made up long ago not him nor any other man would she wed some early disappointment perhaps mused the major a curate at shepherd's bush those young men have a great deal to answer for they came to the hyacinth dell an earthly paradise to the two happy lovers who were sitting on a mossy bank in a sheet of azure bloom which seen from the distance hathworth young trees looked like blue bright water to the major the hazel copse and the bluebells the young oak plantation and all the lovely details of mosses and flowering grasses and starry anemones were odious he felt in a hurry to get back to his club and steep himself in london pleasures all the benevolence seemed to have been crushed out of him christabel saw that her old friend was out of spirits and contrived to be by his side on their way back to the boat trying to cheer him with sweetest words and loveliest smiles have we tired you she asked the afternoon is very warm tired me you forget how i ramble over the hills at home no i am just a trifle put out but it is nothing i had news of a death this morning a death that makes me richer by four hundred a year if it were not for respect for my dead cousin who so kindly made me his heir i think i should go to-night to the most rowdy theatre in london just to put myself in spirits which are the rowdy theatres uncle oliver well perhaps i ought not to use such a word the theatres are all good in their way but there are theatres and theatres i should choose one of those to which the young men go night after night to see the same piece a burlesque or an opera bouffe plenty of smart jokes and pretty girls why have you not taken me to those theatres we have not come to them yet you have seen shakespeare and modern comedy which is rather a weak material as compared with sheridan or even with coleman and morton whose plays were our staple entertainment when i was a boy you have heard all the opera singers yes you have been very good but i want to see cupid and psyche two of my partners last night talked to me of cupid and psyche and were astounded that i had not seen it i felt quite ashamed of my ignorance i asked one of my partners who was particularly enthusiastic to tell me all about the play and he did to the best of his ability which was not great and he said that a miss maine stella maine who plays psyche is simply adorable she is the loveliest woman in london he says and was greatly surprised that she had not been pointed out to me in the park now really uncle oliver this is very remiss in you you who are so clever in showing me famous people when we are driving in the park my dear we have not happened to see her that is all replied the major without any responsive smile at the bright young face smiling up at him you have seen her i suppose yes i saw her when i was last in london not this time not this time you most unenthusiastic person but i understand your motive 
you have been waiting an opportunity to take jessie and me to see this divine psyche is she absolutely lovely loveliness is a matter of opinion she is generally accepted as a particularly pretty woman when will you take me to see her i have no idea you have so many engagements your aunt is always making new ones i can do nothing without her permission surely you like dancing better than sitting in a theatre no i do not dancing is delightful enough but to be in a theatre is to be in fairyland it is like going into a new world i leave myself and my own life at the doors and go to live and love and suffer and be glad with the people in the play to see a powerful play really well acted such acting as we have seen is to live a new life from end to end in a few hours it is like getting the essence of a lifetime without any of the actual pain for when the situation is too terrible one can pinch oneself and say it is only a dream and act a dream if you like powerful plays plays that make you tremble and cry you would not care two pence for cupid and psyche said major brie it is something between a burlesque and a fairy comedy a most frivolous kind of entertainment i believe i don't care how frivolous it is i have set my heart upon seeing it i don't want to be out of the fashion if you won't get me a box at the where is it the kaleidoscope theatre at the kaleidoscope i shall ask angus please don't i-i shall be seriously offended if you do let me arrange the business with your aunt if you really want to see the piece i suppose you must see it but not unless your aunt likes dearest dearest kindest uncle oliver cried christabel squeezing his arm from my childhood upwards you have always fostered my self-will by the blindest indulgence i was afraid that all at once you were going to be unkind and thwart me major brie was thoughtful and silent for the rest of the afternoon and although jessie tried to be as sharp-spoken and vivacious as usual the effort would have been obvious to any two people properly qualified to observe the actions and expressions of others but angus and christabel being completely absorbed in each other saw nothing amiss in their companions the river and landscape were divine a river for gods a wood for nymphs altogether too lovely for mortals tea served on a little round table in the hotel garden was perfect how much nicer than the dinner to-night exclaimed christabel i wish we were not going and yet it will be very pleasant i dare say a table decorated with the loveliest flowers well-dressed women clever men all talking as if there was not a care in life and perhaps we shall be next to each other added the happy girl looking at angus what a comfort to me that i am out of it said jessie how nice to be an insignificant young woman whom nobody ever dreams of asking to dinner a powdered old dowager did actually hint at my going to her musical evening the other day when she called in bolton row be sure you come early she said gushingly to mrs tregonell and christabel and then in quite another key glancing at me she added and if miss er er would like to hear my singers i should be er er delighted no doubt mentally adding i hope she won't have the impertinence to take me at my word jessie you are the most evil-thinking person i ever knew cried christabel i am sure lady millamont meant to be civil yes but did she not mean me to go to her party retorted jessie the happy days the society evenings slipped by dining music dancing and now came the bright season of rustic entertainments more dancing more music lawn tennis archery water parties every device by which the summer hours may chime in tune with pleasure it was july christabel's birthday had come and gone bringing a necklace of single diamonds and a basket of june roses from angus and the most perfect thing in park hacks from mrs tregonell but christabel's wedding day more fateful than any birthday except the first had not yet been fixed albeit mr hamley pressed for a decision upon this vital point it was to have been at midsummer he said one day when he had been discussing the question tete-a-tete -tete with mrs tregonell indeed angus i never said that i told you that christabel would be twenty at midsummer and that i would not consent to the marriage until after then precisely but surely that meant soon after i thought we should be married early in july in time to start for the tyrol in golden weather i never had any fixed date in my mind answered mrs tregonell with a pained look 
struggle with herself as she might this engagement of christabel's was a disappointment and a grief to her i thought my son would have returned before now i should not like the wedding to take place in his absence and i should like him to be at the wedding said angus but i think it will be rather hard if we have to wait for the caprice of a traveller who from what bell tells me of his letters has bell shown you any of his letters asked mrs tregonell with a vexed look no i don't think he has written to her has he no of course not his letters are always addressed to me he is a wretched correspondent i was going to say that from what bell tells me your son's movements appear most uncertain and it really does not seem worth while to wait when the wedding day is fixed i will send him a message by the atlantic cable we must have him at the wedding mr hamley did not see the necessity but he was too kind to say so he pressed for a settlement as to the day or week or at least the month in which his marriage was to take place and at last mrs tregonell consented to the beginning of september they were all agreed now that the fittest marriage temple for this particular bride and bridegroom was the little old church in the heart of the hills the church in which christabel had worshipped every sunday morning or afternoon ever since she could remember it was christabel's own desire to kneel before that familiar altar on her wedding day in the solemn peacefulness of that loved hillside with friendly honest country faces round her rather than in the midst of a fashionable crowd attended by bridesmaids after gainsborough and page-boys after van dyke in an atmosphere heavy with the scent of s bouquet mr hamley had no near relations and albeit a whole bevy of cousins and a herd of men from the clubs would have gladly attended to witness his excision from the ranks of gilded youth and to bid him godspeed on his voyage to the domestic haven their presence at the sacrifice would have given him no pleasure while on the other hand there was one person resident in london whose presence would have caused him acute pain thus each of the lovers pleading for the same favour mrs tregonell had forgone her idea of a london wedding and had come to see that it would be very hard upon all the kindly inhabitants of forbury and minster Bowcastle, trevalga bossony and trevina to deprive them of the pleasurable excitement to be derived from christabel's wedding early in september in the golden light of that lovely time they were to be quietly married in the dear old church and then away to tyrolean woods and hills scenes which for christabel seemed to be the chosen background of poetry legend and romance rather than an actual country provided with hotels and accessible by tourists once having consented to the naming of an exact time mrs tregonell felt there could be no withdrawal of her word she telegraphed to leonard who was somewhere in the rocky mountains with a chosen friend a couple of english servants and three or four canadians and who were he so minded could be home in a month and having dispatched this message she felt the last wrench had been endured nothing that could ever come afterwards save death itself could give her a sharper pain poor leonard she replied it will break his heart in the years that were gone she had so identified herself with her son's hopes and schemes had so projected her thoughts into his future seeing him in her waking dreams as he would be in the days to come a model squire possessed of all his father's old-fashioned virtues with a great deal of modern cleverness superadded a proud and happy husband the father of a noble race she had kept this vision of the future in her mind so long had dwelt upon it so fondly had coloured it so brightly that to forego it now to say to herself this thing was but a dream which i dreamed and it can never be realised was like relinquishing a part of her own life she was a deeply religious woman and if called upon to bear physical pain to suffer the agonies of a slow incurable illness she would have suffered with the patience of a christian martyr saying to herself as brave dr arnold said in the agony of his sudden fatal malady whom he loveth he chasteneth but she could not surrender the daydream of her life without bitterest repining in all her love of christabel in all her careful education and moral training of the niece to whom she had been as a mother there had been this leaven of selfishness she had been rearing a wife for her son such a wife as would be a man's better angel a guiding restraining elevating principle so interwoven with his life that he should never know himself in leading strings an influence so gently exercised that he should never suspect that he was influenced leonard has a noble heart and a fine manly character the mother had often told herself but he wants the association of a milder nature than his own he is just the kind of man to be guided and governed by a good wife 
a wife who would obey his lightest wish and yet rule him always for good she had seen how when leonard had been disposed to act unkindly or illiberally by a tenant christabel had been able to persuade him to kindness or generosity how when he had set his face against going to church being minded to devote sunday morning to the agreeable duty of cleaning a favourite gun or physicking a favourite spaniel or greasing a cherished pair of fishing boots christabel had taken him there how she had softened and toned down his small social discourtesies checked his tendency to strong language and as it were expurgated edited and amended him and having seen and rejoiced in this state of things it was very hard to be told that another had won the wife she had moulded after her own fashion to the gladness and glory of her son's life all the harder because it was her own short-sighted folly which had brought angus hamley to mount royal all through that gay london season for christabel a time of unclouded sadness carking care had been at mrs tregonell's heart she tried to be just to the niece whom she dearly loved and who had so tenderly and fully repaid her affection yet she could not help feeling as if christabel's choice was a personal injury nay almost treachery and ingratitude she must have known that i meant her to be my son's wife she said to herself yet she takes advantage of my poor boy's absence and gives herself to the first comer surely september is soon enough she said pettishly when angus pleaded for an earlier date you will not have known christabel for a year even then some men love a girl for half a lifetime before they win her but it was not my privilege to know christabel at the beginning of my life replied angus i made the most of my opportunities by loving her the moment i saw her it is impossible to be angry with you sighed mrs tregonell you are so like your father that was one of the worst hardships of the case mrs tregonell could not help liking the man who had thwarted the dearest desire of her heart she could not help admiring him and making comparisons between him and leonard not to the advantage of her son had not her first love been given to his father the girl's romantic love ever so much more fervid and intense than any later passion the love that sees ideal perfection in a lover End of chapter six